Okay, welcome back to members of 121 Community Church in Grapevine, Texas, and our ongoing study in Church Dogmatics by Emil Brunner, first published in German in 1946. We're going to conclude Chapter 10, be pages 250 to 260, on the doctrine of faith. And uh, the first half was very good, and uh, the second half is uh, just as uh, welcome and very definitive work. We'll look at it in three moments. Let's go to block one. And he begins with, in Christ, word and person become one. And uh, Brunner said this many times already in his uh, two volumes, that uh, only Christ as person could reveal God as personal. And so this is important uh, to remember as we go through uh, Brunner's systematic theology, because remember, he's all about personalism, a personal relationship restored with our Father in heaven through Christ, where word and person become one. The objective basis of faith takes place within the dialectic of the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. Remember the previous lesson. Both within God's providence. Liberalism restricts itself to the Jesus of history only. It rejects the apostolic witness altogether. And neo-orthodoxy um, as a protest against liberalism. That was Barth's position. That is Brunner's position. So they very much both opposed liberalism. So we negate the mistaken autonomy of liberalism. We ourselves are to be witnesses to Christ because we see Jesus as the Christ. We see Jesus as Son of Man and Son of God. And that's so true. We see both. We see in Christ, we see Son of Man and Son of God. Liberalism does not grasp the real Jesus whatsoever. So to wrap up block one, we have objective faith and negating liberalism equals reality of revelation. And that's the key, because conservative evangelical German theologians affirmed revelation as a reality. Liberalism rejected transcendence. Liberalism rejected the reality of revelation. Revelation is decisive concerning our conviction concerning Christ. We affirm the revelation of the prophets especially all of the post-exilic prophets uh, that ran about from 500 B.C. They were the bridge that bridged between the Old and the New Testament. And so we definitely affirm those uh, post-exilic prophets, those minor prophets that played such a significant role. Well, we just finished a study just recently on Second Isaiah, uh, a post-exilic prophet that uh, was all about the coming Christ. So that's very much a definite truth. We do affirm the revelation of the prophets. They were empowered out of God's transcendence. In Christ, final revelation becomes manifest. Word and person become one. Only Christ as person could restore personal relationship with our Father in heaven. Christ told his disciples, call God our Father in heaven. He wanted to restore and to make known that he came to restore personal relationship with our Father in heaven, which was the original creation covenant. At the very moment of creation, Man and woman had personal relationship with God. No need for the mediation of the law. It was personal relationship. Christ restored and does continue to restore personal relationship. Let's go on to block two. 
Now, liberalism rejects apostolic witness, and so Bruner wants to talk about what happens when confronted by the apostolic witness. The apostolic witness, which we accept as historical reality, especially in the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, without stressing Neoplatonic rationalism, because, and here's key, because our Christian worldview includes the possibility and the reality of revelation. It includes transcendence, it includes the realm of spirit. All of that is denied by liberalism. We proclaim and we hold fast to a worldview of uh, the reality of revelation the reality of transcendence, the genuine reality of transcendence. So forming and living with a revelatory worldview, we recognize the reality of sin and the need of forgiveness. That's a critical first step. If you're not uh, convicted of a need for repentance, then you're already blinded. We begin with that uh, recognition of the need for forgiveness. We are not self-sufficient beings. We don't believe, uh, we, we don't uh, live according to the self. We don't uh, get wrapped up in this uh, current idolatry in today's culture of egoism. It's, it's the biggest idol of the day, egoism. Whoever thought we'd come up with the word selfie? <laughs> oh, man taking selfies. Oh my goodness. Okay. Anyway, that's the biggest and the worst idolatry in the world, but we are not self-sufficient beings. We negate egoism. We recognize that we need a savior. I recognize that every day of my life. We need a savior and the edifice of self-justification by works that has broken down entirely. And for Paul, that broke down entirely. So we conclude block two with uh, the apostolic witness and the revelatory worldview will bring about genuine self-knowledge. And that's important. Uh, you're going to find out just how important in block three, but that's important. There is a personal revelation of God, says Bruner. This is personalism by Bruner. There is a personal revelation of God, and knowledge of Christ brings about existential self-knowledge, opening the self to one's created original created nature. Christ reveals true God and true humanity. True existence means to live within the agape, self-sacrificial love of God, to live within Christ crucified, Christ exalted, Christ resurrected. That is the agape of God. Christ discloses this divine mystery. And then revelation for us becomes existential certainty. Now I want you to hang on to that uh, last statement I just made. Because uh, I've had the question put to me, you know, how can you believe in God? How do you know that God is real? I mean, how, which, what's your proof for God? And as every neo-Orthodox neo theologian would tell you, from Karl Barth to Emil Brunner to uh, Jürgen Moltmann to Pannenberg, all of them will tell you, including this theologian, I will also tell you, you don't prove God rationally. You don't make a list of rational propositional statements to prove God. Proof for the reality of God is always existential reality. It's what is real for the existence of the human being. And when that becomes a reality, that's all the proof you need. And so, you know, how do you convey that? Well, I don't know, because how is it acquired? through faith, but uh, we have eight 
axiomatic aspects of what I'm talking about here in block three. And uh, Bruner is, I'm 72 years old. I'm learning Christian doctrine at the age of 72. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I've never studied Emil Bruner my entire life. I never, I, yeah, I, you know, I, I studied him in, in an overview, I think, at one point. But uh, never have I dug into Emil Bruner's theology in depth. And uh, he's a great theologian. I love him as a teacher. But let's take a look at Block 3. It's a very powerful conclusion, and it's a... Uh, precisely gives you the eight aspects of why we can say with existential certainty there is a personal God. I believe in a personal God through a revelatory Christ as word and person. Knowledge of God, ex existential certainty, eight aspects. It comes to us through the self-knowledge of seeing ourselves in Christ. That's it. You know, we discover ourselves in Christ. He reveals true humanity. And that uh, is a revelatory self-knowledge. Through Christ we have restored original existence. It becomes truth as a gift, which becomes our indwelling own through the indwelling Holy Spirit. Christ reveals God's being. Christ reveals our being. And this is what it is, through faith knowledge, not Neoplatonic rationalism, through faith knowledge. And the living organism of revelatory truth, objective revelatory reality, and subjective revelatory awakening. We believe, as conservative evangelical neo-Orthodox believers, we believe in a realm of transcendence, which is a realm of revelation. It lies above and beyond the uh, surface reality. It is the foundation of surface reality, and it's called in Scripture realm of spirit or kingdom of God and through spiritual vision spiritual hearing we perceive a realm of transcendence a realm of eternal truth a realm of the eschatological movement of the Holy Spirit from dunamis potentiality to energy actuality the Holy Spirit is always in a process of movement from dunamis, potentiality, to energy, actuality. Those are the New Testament concepts, by the way. And uh, keep that locked up in your memory because whenever you see that in a Greek interlinear or whatever, remember that. The Holy Spirit is always in movement. We freeze it to talk about the Holy Spirit, but always the Holy Spirit is moving from dunamis, potentiality, to energy, actuality. So we're talking about faith knowledge in 3.6 and the organism of objective revelation and subjective awareness of that revelation. Historical word becomes eternal word. There you go. That dialectic of the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. Where do we live? Where do we live as believers? Well, we live this is dialectical theology. We live within a dialectic. And uh, the previous lesson said it's discovered primarily in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, even though I love the Gospel of John. It's discovered in the Synoptic Gospels because there we see the dialectic of the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith in very close relationship. And so Bruner says, go to the Synoptic Gospels. Go to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Go to the Synoptic Gospels because they are the best at that uh, dialectic between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. And that's where we live. That is where we live. And because I live there, it has been proven to me existentially as a matter of my own 
existence. That's what X essentially means, something that matters for your existence. It has been proven to me that God lives, God is real, and God is personal. I agree with Bruner 100%. And this is so critical for us. And uh, that's going to wrap up uh, Chapter 10. And a, a beautiful, very accessible chapter. I mean, you got to love Bruner. Very accessible chapter of very profound truth. Very accessible to everyone. But very, very deeply profound. And I love where we're going next, my friends. Because we are going to... Chapter 10, 260 to 270, and it's on eschatology. We're going to see how Jürgen Moltmann plugs into neo-orthodoxy uh, along with Brunner. So next time, Chapter 11, and it's going to be, yeah, Chapter 11, 260 to 270, and it'll be on eschatology. Chapter 11, 260 to 270. That's going to wrap up 10b. That's going to wrap up uh, the doctrine of faith that we covered in two parts. And we'll take a look at eschatology next lesson.